These are the three elementary row operations, and these operations can be performed on a matrix to get it into what's called row echelon form. Throughout this course, there will be countless times we need to put a matrix into row echelon form. For a matrix to be in row echelon form, it must have these three properties. Any row that doesn't consist entirely of zeros must have one as its first non-zero number. All rows that do consist entirely of zeros must be at the bottom of the matrix below all of the non-zero rows, and in any two successive rows that don't consist entirely of zeros, the leading one in the lower row must occur further to the right than the leading one in the higher row, which will create a sort of staircase pattern of leading ones. Of course, typically a matrix will not be in this row echelon form, so again, to get it into that form, we must perform elementary row operations. And thankfully, every matrix can be transformed into row echelon form by a sequence of those elementary row operations, and this process is called Gaussian elimination. It's the way that we change a matrix into row echelon form. Let's go through an example with this 3x3 three three matrix here. The first thing we might want to do is get a leading one in this first row. This first row doesn't consist entirely of zeros, so we want its first entry to be one. One elementary row operation we could use to accomplish that is multiply the row by one half. If we multiply row one by one half, then this leading entry will become positive one. But another option is to swap two rows. We could swap rows one and three, and then we would have a leading one in that first entry. Swapping rows one and three gets us to this matrix here. The advantage of that strategy is that we don't have any fractions yet. Now that we have this leading one, we'll want to introduce zeros below it. So we want this to be a zero, and we want this to be a zero. That way, our next leading one, which is going to be right here, will occur further to the right than the one above it. These are the two elementary row operations we need to perform to get zeros below this first leading one. We need to add row one to row two, so that this one and negative one will cancel out. So that's written there, add row one to row two. And we need to subtract two row one from row three. That way we would have two minus two times one, and again, give us that zero. So performing those operations brings us to this matrix. Adding row one to row two gives us negative one plus one is zero, two plus one is three, negative three plus four is one. Subtracting 2 row 1 from row 3 gives us this. 2 minus 2 is 0, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, and negative 3 minus 8 is negative 11. Now we want this, the first non-zero entry in row 2, to be positive 1. So we'll multiply row 2 by 1 third. Now we're going to turn this first non-zero entry in row 2 into a 1. But after we do that, we'll also want this entry that's below the leading one to be zero. So let's just make this entry zero now by adding row two to row three. Then the three and the negative three will cancel out. So adding row two to row three gives us this. We have zero plus zero, which is zero, negative three plus three, which is zero, and negative 11 plus one, which is negative 10. Now, all we have to do is multiply row 2 by a third to turn this entry into a positive 1, and multiply row 3 by negative 1 tenth to turn that entry into positive 1. Doing those two multiplications gets us to this matrix, which finally is in row echelon form. So we would stop here. There is another form we could put it in called reduced row echelon form. In reduced row echelon form, each leading one has zeros not only below it, 
but also above it. So if we wanted to get this into reduced row echelon form, we could perform a few more row operations to get zeros above the leading ones. First, we would do a couple of subtractions to get zeros above this leading one, which would bring us to this matrix, and then just subtract row two from row one to get a zero above that leading one. And that gets us to this matrix, which is in reduced row echelon form. So that's an example of the Gaussian elimination process to turn a matrix into echelon form. Again, we were in row echelon form at this step. It's important to remember that there's not one right way to get a matrix into row echelon form. We could have performed different steps in different orders to get this matrix into row echelon form, and row echelon form isn't even unique. So you may perform a different sequence of steps and arrive at a different row echelon form. On the other hand, these last couple steps we completed to get into reduced row echelon form, that form is unique, so there'd be no way to arrive at a different reduced row echelon form. Here's one more example you could try. This is a three by four matrix. Go ahead and try putting it into row echelon form using Gaussian elimination. I'll put the steps on screen now, at least the steps that I took. So here are the steps I took to get this matrix into row echelon form. It's possible you used different steps and arrived at a different but still valid answer, but your answer should look something like that. This first step was to get a leading one in that first non-zero row, and then we introduced a zero below it by subtracting three row one from row two. And then we turned this into a leading one by multiplying row two by two thirds. And then we got a zero below that by subtracting eight row two from row three. And then finally, we multiplied row three by negative one over 28 to get a leading one there. So that's how to put a matrix into row echelon form. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. Thanks for watching.